Hi guys, I'm Justin G0KSC of the Ham Radio Guy channel. Uh, welcome, and it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you on this uh, this episode uh, to a real Ham Radio Guy, uh, K5FLU, Martin Jew of MFJ Enterprises in the US. Um, I've known Martin for quite some time, a number of years since my involvement with Walters and Stanton. And uh, we spent some time together, we've also worked together, and uh, he's, a, he's got a, a wealth of knowledge and been around for a very long time in this business. And he's now, um, as a, a part of MFJ Enterprise, he's the largest manufacturer of ham radio accessories in the world. Now, when I asked Martin to do this uh, video uh, with me, he agreed to take questions from you guys. And he's also uh, agreed to answer the rough and the smooth questions too. We didn't get enough time to do every single question there was, but it's an interesting watch, so please do take the time to watch through all the various different sections of this uh, this interview. Um, if you like the content, please do press the like button below. If you'd like to see similar content, then please press the subscribe. And I will be interviewing another very prominent ham radio guy very soon, so keep an eye out for that. In the meantime, thanks and happy hamming. Hi guys, this is uh, Justin, G0KSC, on the uh, Ham Radio Guy show this evening. And finally, I've managed to lock down and track down uh, Martin Jew, who joins us today. Uh, and we're going to run through some of these questions that you guys asked us in the uh, comments box on the uh, the video when uh, I announced that Martin was going to join us. Um, we've just been having a, a few words uh, before we started here, just to see how he was going to do it. And we, and we was looking at just having a discussion. We'll talk over some of the questions that you've got here, some that, you, that you've uh, posed, um, and um, we'll, we'll just see how it goes from there. But one of the things that I do need to do is a bit of a disclosure, really, is we do work together. Uh, I've designed some antennas that um, MFJ, High Gain, and Cushcraft uh, do manufacture. So with that out of the way, um, welcome to the show, Martina. Thanks very much for being uh, the first um, ham radio guy on the show as it were and um, hopefully uh, we're going to have uh, a, an interesting dialogue between us that uh, uh, viewers are going to find as, as much of an interest as it would be uh, for me I'm sure when I ask you some of these questions okay well so, it's uh, appreciate you uh, asking me to come on your show and talk to you uh, I'm Martin Jew uh, MFJ Enterprises um uh talking to you from uh starkville mississippi yeah yeah on a on a friday um, yeah um, on a friday so friday uh, afternoon I for you, you friday um, evening for me here oh that's right so we got a, a question here from w h j okay, let me see that one and it's he says okay I've owned a lot of MFJ stuff over nearly the five decades I've been a ham. And one persistent difficulty is the wildly inconsistent quality control. Can Martin address this? So it's an interesting and maybe uh, even potentially a difficult question, but I know it's one that you, you wanted to speak about. So um, maybe you can go ahead and... and uh... Okay. <clears throat> yeah, well, you know, that's a uh, uh, a problem we've been working with for a long long time and we, we always have procedures in place but our workforce is pretty diverse and we have a, a, a number of employees but it's very diverse and it's a transient workforce and um, um, as people come and go those procedures have to be retaught uh, each time right. they're here uh, so we're constantly working on it, and uh, technicians are are few and far between down here in, in the deep south, uh, deep south. And you know the products are pretty well engineered, and they're designed well, and they work uh, well uh, when they're built right. And most of the complaints that we have are small complaints. They're things like. Somebody forgot to solder a solder joint, or somebody uh, didn't put a, a stick of rubber feet on, or they didn't tighten a set screw on a knob. 
but they're usually minor stuff that keeps it doesn't keep it from working but they're pretty sure. annoying right yeah. uh, and the um uh, and, and things are really not nearly as bad as uh what it appears to be uh most of those problems have cleared up uh a lot of it is just from the days of the past and it just keeps following us around right yeah so obviously it's it, as you mentioned there it's it's an aspect of churn people that are coming and going and having to re-educate uh, as well and then maybe um, partly due to the location and the available workforce where you are now there's going to be some new hams as well as old that are watching this uh, martin can you give those of us that aren't aware how long mfj has been around and why mfj is a name that every ham uh, if they've been a ham more than a few months or so are going to know Okay. Uh, next year, we will have been in business for 50 years. Wow. That's that's longer than lots of the new hams have been alive. <laughs> been. <laughs> sure thing, yeah. Uh, I started as a ham radio operator in 1960. That's been 61 years ago. That was back in the days when... There were no transceivers. There was no very little, little single sideband, and the basic mode was CW, AM, and sideband. And those were the days when we had separate receiver and separate transmitters. Um, and um, but um, the our products are made mostly here in Starkville, Mississippi. Um, we do manufacturing um, from the actual parts, from the inductors. We make the var air variable capacitors. We make the cabinets. Uh, it's it's a pretty integrated uh, operation here, <clears throat> and we have um, dealers in over 35 countries direct dealers there's there's more than that because some of these dealers sell to other countries themselves yeah um we we probably have more of our products that has been in use than uh by far any other single company uh, um and just because we've been around for a long time and the number of products that we have so uh, um, most ham shacks will have something of ours in their ham station yeah i think you're right so if i can yeah. just lead on from that with a couple of questions myself in that time during that time what has been the most successful product well the most successful product uh, has been the uh, antenna analyzer, which uh, we invented here in Starkville. Okay. That happened one Sunday afternoon when I was in my office working on my workbench behind my desk. Uh, we were making a uh, resistance bridge with a built-in oscillator. Uh, but you had to balance the bridge to get the RF resistance. You had to turn a knob and, and find a null. <clears throat> so I was looking for a way to measure RF resistance on a meter directly without having to turn a knob. And it all of a sudden occurred to me, well, why am I going to all that trouble when I can just read SWR directly? And then within a few minutes within that afternoon i had the first swr analyzer and wow. we started marketing that that's been narely 30 years ago a wow. long time ago yeah, yeah and i, I remember anyway sorry yeah. oh no it, it it all grew from that point on and then we started adding functions where you can add uh find the impedance the resistance the uh uh, reactants, uh, then uh, be able to measure inductance and capacitance and frequency and uh, 
coax impedance and lead length, uh, coax lengths and just started adding a bunch of functions. And because it didn't take long for people to start copying these products. And now yeah. um, uh, there's lots of versions of it. Some of them are cheaper than ours. Uh, some of them are less expensive than ours. But ours still sells a lot uh, because there's so many of them in use and friends have recommended it. And the, the, uh, probably the biggest virtue is just so easy to use. Yeah, uh, it's very intuitive. You turn a knob and you get what you want. Some of these other functions um, that some of the other companies have have some esoteric functions that they hardly ever use, and they're computer type of products. And it, it's a uh, it, it's a, some of them have pretty steep learning curve, and it's much harder to use than ours. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think that's the 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 nail on the button there is the fact of the ease of use just having the small swr uh, meter display and the the variable uh, capacitor or resistor or whatever it is that is controlled on the front i haven't delved inside to to see what it is just to see where that peak or the dip is so very simple and you don't have to have uh too long in any instruction manual to get it to 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 work so would it be yes. correcting yes. sorry Oh no, it's it's all very intuitive. You use it just like you would use your radio. Yeah. Now, there's 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 two things about it that makes it better. Uh, one is that it uses a pretty pure sine wave, which is important because if you use a square wave, like lots of them do, uh, the harmonics of that square wave can give you readings that are not correct. Right. Uh, especially with loads that uh, have some reactants in it. Now, the other thing is the output is much higher than some of the other ones. And the reason that's important is if there are some close RF fields, you can't make measurements if you have a low output. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. And, and of course, now in the more recent versions, you go up to 70 SEMs as well. I think it's a, oh, a 269, yeah, yeah. right? Oh, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, yeah, you're right. It'll cover from 100 kilohertz up to 400, I forgot, 470, something like that. That's great stuff. Megahertz. And then yeah. what's next on the list? Would that be the ATUs, auto ATUs? Oh, yeah. Uh, our best-selling products are the, yeah, the automatic antenna tuners and also the manual antenna tuners. Right. Well, uh, that mm -hmm. that leads us on to the the, the CT seven ARQ question, I guess, because okay. he asked a couple of interesting ones here. Um, now one is, or the second one is about the the, uh, the the tuners or the capacitors in them. But he says, with regards to the MFJ nine two three two QRP loop, is it possible to implement a simple lead tuning circuit? That was question uh, one. <clears throat> okay, uh, that would be very easy to do. Um, uh, the probably the easiest. Uh, well, there's a number of ways to do it. One would be to use a resistive bridge, and it. Uh, anyway, that, the answer to that is yes. It would be very easy to do. And that's something I'll look into. See if we can add it into it. Brilliant, and that's that's the the, the greatness of um, scenarios like this, where you get questions from the user going straight to the guy at the top. The the second question he asks here actually is, is it possible to to buy the variable capacitors used in the tuners, in order that hams could build their own antenna loop projects? Uh, absolutely. Um, in fact, you can buy anything that we have. Is Everything right? is for sale. <laughs> <laughs> so is that but, something that's on the website? You can buy parts on the website or you need to make a special yeah. request? No, all the parts are on the website. Now, they have our parts numbers on them. Um, you can, if you can't find it on the website, just give us a call or send us an email and give us some kind of description and we can find it for you. But, uh, but all the parts are 
available, the variable capacitors that we make, um, the uh, uh, roll inductors, even the air wound inductors are available, even things like transistors and capacitors. And we keep parts for uh, products that uh, we made 30, 40, 50 years ago. Wow. <clears throat> um, I forgot to mention that not only uh, is do we have MFJ here, but also high gain, Cushcraft, Ameritron, Mirage, and Vectronics. And we have parts for the high gain Cushcraft antennas that goes all the way back to the beginning of high gain, which is back in the 1950s. Wow. We have all the toolings and we still have all the parts for them. That's very good. Now, I know with some yeah. product, you when, when a, a product is sunset, uh, the manufacturers would make for some, maybe three or four years afterwards parts, but what you're saying is you go much back, much further back than that. Uh, yeah, and these are parts that we still make. If you have a rotator that's been up there for the last 30 years and you need to repair parts for them, we have it. If you have a, an old uh, uh, high-gain uh, Yagi you've had for the last 40 years, we still have those parts. Right. Uh, um, let me mention something about uh, loop antennas. Uh, loop antennas, uh, in order for those to work and be efficient, you have to have extremely low loss. And we have uh, butterfly capacitors that have no rotating parts that will make a loop capacitor work really well. I know a lot of People are trying to use the variable capacitors that have uh, rotating contacts, and there's so much loss in it right. that the efficiency is unbelievably low. But if you use a uh, butterfly capacitor that does not have rotating contacts, uh, you can get a very highly efficient uh, loop antenna. Those are hard to find, but we have them, and we make them, and they're available. That's an interesting point. So not just the um the loop antennas that you supply but also that the, the home builder could could acquire those or buy those from you to make their own they, they can't and we have a version of these where every plate is welded so there's almost no loss resistance at all most of the capacitors are made where the plates are just pressure has pressure contacts right <clears throat> That's that's pretty a um, pretty uh, interesting stuff. So, is that is that a special order, or are they all made that way? Are they are all welded. Um, we have two versions of the butterfly capacitor. The one that we use in our loops are are the ones that are welded, and then we have a series of loop antenna tuners where you can attach a loop wire to it, and those are butterfly the plates are not welded okay but they're still more efficient than any uh, capacitor that you can use that has a rotating contact right yeah okay all right well, um if we go on to the next which was from kh2 sr um i've always had good luck with the quality of the mfj gear uh, they're wildly um there are a wide variety of ham radio equipment is impressive I would also like to see uh, MFJ release a wider variety of through um, of ham-related kits, uh, maybe some uh, VHF analog FM uh, transmitter kits, for example, uh, HF, AM voice, and double sideband module uh, QRP kits. So this is a common question that we've had quite a way through here uh, uh, that um, has resonated in a number of different um, areas not just from from here but uh, but when I've spoken about uh, MFJ with people in the past that they would like to have some of the products but in kit form to build themselves in the the way that the Heath kit stuff used to be done is that something that could be implemented or would that cause a, a problem no that is something that we can do and we do do some of that we used to do more of that now, um, back in the heat kit days, 
uh, kits were uh, the way that you got your ham radio equipment. And one of the reasons was because of the way equipment was built. It was point-to-point mm. -point wiring. Nowadays, uh, the electronic products are built by machines, and it was much more expensive to build it from a kit than it is just to let the machine build it. Um, but that, that's only one of the problems. It's more expensive to produce a kit because by the time we go and get all the parts together, we can have the whole thing built by a machine far less expensive. Right, I see, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Now, the, <clears throat> um, but what we can do, and we do this, is to make a kit that is a combination of through-hole parts and surface mount. I mean, for example, if uh, you have a PC board with a lot of uh, components on it, we can surface mount that, and you can have that and treat it as a part, and all the rest of it can be put together yourself. And by doing that, you can save a lot more money because it will be cheaper for us to to give you the uh, board that's already been populated yeah. and then the one that requires all the labor you can do that yourself now one of the other problems that we have had in the past was uh, when the builder makes a mistake uh, he tends to get on the phone and call and that would take up uh, a lot of time for our techs to help them troubleshoot it right I see. but nowadays yeah but nowadays there's so many forums that they can get on and they will help each other yeah so that kind of solves that problem but we need to have some more kits we have an antenna tuner uh that is a <laughs> kit which is an ideal uh product for a kit because that's a lot of point-to-point -point wiring a lot of labor in it and then we have some transceiver kits which it's a hybrid we uh, populate uh, all the surface mount boards and then you do the rest of the work right but we need to bring out some more kits yeah um, <clears throat> yeah I guess maybe um, I can see that in a lot of cases uh, and, and certainly from what you're saying and I understand the support aspect can be a, a very expensive part of it if you need to provide more pull, uh, support for putting stuff together that it it could in many cases end up more expensive producing kits than a finished product so i guess you would have to be fairly selective about what kits you had or what products you had in kit form yeah yeah okay well let's um let's have a look on here uh this is a, a simple question from va3tyb uh, and he says mfj1234 software open source or not open source So does that? Um... Um, okay. Most of the software that's used in that program um, is open source. Now there's there's two or three sections of it that was written and is proprietary. That's written by Howard Nurse. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but the rest of it is open source now the problem is getting all that stuff together and integrating it and making it into one two three four requires a pretty good bit of knowledge to do that right yeah um but eventually uh howard wants to make it all open source okay that's an interesting one so that's something that may be future wise yeah yeah that that's that's his plan Okay, well, um, next one on here is from N0LWF. How did Martin get started in the MFJ company? Now, I guess this is where we come on to what I would um, call uh, you as being uh, the uh, the true American dream. Is that right, from, from humble beginnings? Uh, yeah, I... Uh Group. I was born and raised in the Mississippi Delta, and I grew up in a little country grocery store. And um, when I was six years old, seven years old, my father passed away, 
So there was me and my mother, my little brother, my little sister, and um, my. I had a sister who was 22 years older than me. She and her husband and family came to help us out. So they stayed stayed with us and helped us. And we all lived in the back of our little country grocery store. And, and the whole place, the store and the living quarters, was about maybe a thousand square feet and at one time there were 11 of us in the back of that store <laughs> wow. and I, I tell everybody there were so many of us we had to sleep crossways on the bed <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> um, but I got interested in radio when, in Cub Scout when I, I was about eight years old and I, I built a crystal radio it was it was a uh, out of a Cub Scout handbook. It was a uh, foxhole crystal radio that the soldiers built during World War II, and the crystal detector was an old rusty razor blade and the pencil lead, and you moved it around until you could hear a station. <laughs> well, built it, got interested. I never could get the radio to work, but it got me interested in it, <laughs> and... That's where it all started, but I knew at age eight that I wanted to be an electrical engineer. But uh, growing up in a grocery store, I thought everybody had their own business. This was back in the 1950s right. when it was common. I mean, people had their own welding shop and shoe stores, and, you know, they just did their own things. They didn't have a bunch of jobs, so yeah. I, I grew up thinking everybody had their own business so uh, that's what I wanted to do I just wanted to start a business but when I was in the 10th grade in 1960 I got my ham radio license <clears throat> and uh, after high school I went to Mississippi State University to get a degree in electrical engineering and then I went to Georgia Tech for a master's degree in electrical engineering and then with my brand new master's degree, I went home and ran the grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> my brother wanted to uh, take off for some time. He was running the store. He was a year younger than me. So I ran it for him for about six months. And then I worked for a year. And then I got <clears throat> a call one evening from a professor at Mississippi State and he wanted to know if uh, I wanted to come back to Mississippi State University to work on a PhD. No, so I didn't want to work on a PhD. I just wanted to come home. So I came home, did all the coursework, but that's when I started MFJ. Uh, MFJ started as an engineering design company where I would do circuit design for the uh, uh, research departments at Mississippi State, right. but it didn't take me long to figure out that all I could do was all I could do. I just couldn't get very big very fast, so I uh, designed a couple of products, and the only thing I knew about was ham radio and designed two ham radio products, started selling it through mail order ads in magazines, and uh, <laughs> sold a bunch of uh, CW filters and single sideband filters through the mail and then started making some other products like QRP transmitters, keyers, and and then when we brought an antenna tuner out, uh, that everything started to, to take off. And when we brought that antenna tuner out, we put in a nationwide watch line. There was a toll-free telephone call back in those days. And in that one month in November, we sold more stuff than we did in the whole previous year. <laughs> and we grew to about 30 people real quickly. And I was teaching and working at Mississippi State. And I quit and went to work full-time when we had about 30 people. Wow. Now, I'll, I'll see if I can pull it out because I'm sure I've got it somewhere and I'll put it on to the, uh, the, final, um, the final shoot, as it were. But I have a, a picture 
of you at the Hamvention holding one of the first products. Now, can you remember what that was and what the model number was? Oh, CWFT. It's an uh, active filter. <laughs> there you go. So I'll see if I can I can pull that uh, that out too. But that's a that's an interesting one. There was some some info there um, that I, I wasn't aware of myself, and you know we've had a a, a lot of time um, together in the past, and and uh, you, you you still pick up new things. Okay. Um, now I've got another one here from SM4CHK. Um, Oscar competition from low cost VNAs. Um, how can MFJ analyzers survive? Now, I think you've really covered that um, already with the, the, the simplistic nature in which they can operate. So even the, the, uh, the, the newest hams can use them to good effect and also have being slightly higher output and so on and so forth. So I think that one's a, um, mm -hmm. fairly good in there. Um, <clears throat> There's another one here from VE2HEW where he was mentioning about the, uh, the the kit products. So we've covered that. And then we've got KN6EQZ or Z for the UK uh, viewers. Um, now, he was uh, mentioning about the uh, different uh, coax type, uh, types and um, uh, some of the... Um, um, antenna products that you you use now some of these didn't they come from uh, acquisitions like uh, Kushcraft and uh, the high grain and were were they all acquired products or did the MFJ uh, or did MFJ produce some of the <coughs> antenna products themselves early on um, you're talking about the antenna products yeah well there were because you've got some under the MFJ band haven't you some under yeah. And someone yeah. High yeah. There's four. There's four groups of products. There is the MFJ pro product antenna line, which is what we started off with. There's a whole series of products there, and then there's a line of high gain products which we bought, and then the line of Cushcraft products, uh, which we also bought, and then the products that you designed. Uh, okay and it's just um, it's, it's kind of the legacy stuff that mfj produces and makes goes under the mfj band um, and then the stuff that's under high gain and Cushcraft were acquired with those companies yeah Mo mostly you know, we have designed some new products for for both of those companies okay um now the uh, there's a lot of new products in the MFJ line. There's those are things like the cobweb antenna. Yeah. Uh, things like the um, um, what do you call those uh, those Yagi the spider web antenna? Yeah. Okay. The two element Yagis. Well, there's spider beams and the hex beams. Yeah. Yeah. Hex. Yeah. Hex beams. And then there's things like the octopus, which uses uh, multiple hamsticks. Okay. Uh, they're parallel fed hamsticks. There's like eight of them, so you can get four different bands or dipos. And then there's uh, uh, portable vertical antennas. There's a whole series of MFJ products that are, are current new designs. Now, th there's some. This is just off of the top of my head here and it's something that you just reminded me when you talked about the eight antennas there's such a vast variety of products that mfj do and i remember uh for those that don't know i i was um involved with uh, walters and stanton and nevada and and the the running of those businesses and i remember um i think it was even through a a misorder or something we ended up with this this product it was like a a direction finding product I can't remember the name offhand, but it was uh, it's an MFJ product. You probably know what it is. And you had a number of antennas on mag mounts, I think, that you'd stick on top of a vehicle. And it was um, something I'd never seen before. I didn't know it was a product. So I, I put it on the website. And within a week or so, that one had sold. So we got another one in, and then that one sold. So, you know, some of these, do you, do you know offhand what that product would have been? Yeah, that was the... Uh... Pro, it's, it's a, 
I think that's a Doppler shift. That's how it uses. That that's what it uses to locate. Okay. Uh, it's a direction finder. Yeah. And each one of those antenna will come on and off. Uh, that product is actually. Uh, we actually buy that product. Right. Uh, it was designed by somebody else. Okay. But it's, it was one that I'd ne I didn't even know it existed. And I think another one which was a, a really interesting product to me, which I think you showed me uh, once in the, in the factory, was the little satellite dish with the microphone that you point up to hear where the insulators on, on power lines are, are gone. Yeah, that was that's an interesting product. That's um, what that is, and it is an ultrasonic receiver because when uh, power line insulators arc, they will generate an ultrasonic uh, wave at about 40 kilohertz, and the parabolic uh, reflector will collect those waves and concentrate it to an ultrasonic microphone. And then the box will take that ultrasonic and down convert it to audio so you can hear it. Fantastic. And it, it's very directional. You can locate the exact insulator that, uh, that's been broken down. Yeah. And we also make a version of the same thing that uses an audio microphone that you can take to a uh, ball game and point it down to the referee and hear what they're saying <laughs> <laughs> so do, so are these are these all products that um people can find freely on the on the website or have you got to know the the product number because it's it's like i didn't know those two existed but they had a market because as soon as i knew they existed and we put them on sale people started to buy them but they don't necessarily, it's like the old saying, you don't know what you don't know. If you don't know it's there, you can't buy it. Well, that, that's the problem. It's on the website, and we try to let as many people as we can know about it, but that's really the hard part is just letting people know what you got. Yeah. Yeah. So is that something, um, you know, those two examples, I guess they're not at the, the top end of the, 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 the selling list. Um, and maybe if dealers don't stock them, then people in other countries won't see that they're uh, available. So they really need to look at the MFJ website for the full catalogue, I guess. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah, that, that is fair to say that. And it's even difficult to find there because you have to know what you're looking for to find it. Yeah, and I, and I think it's true to say as well, and maybe... Uh, because I know that some organizations, they operate as a catalog only basis and then just sell through the dealers. But you can actually purchase through the MFJ website, can't you? You can purchase directly from MFJ. You can. And we do that mostly because not all the dealers carry all the products. Yeah. There's too many of them. And if they don't, they can buy it directly from us. But 92% of our sales are through dealers. And 25% of our sales are sold overseas. Oh, right. So it's, it's, a, it's a fairly well biased in the U.S. then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, let's have a look and uh, see what else we've got on here. Um, my question to Martin is, will there be any more battery-powered products for portable use? Uh, and also, will there ever be a QRP ATU half the size of the 16001 or 16010? Uh, um, we have a QRP product that's uh, about half the size of the, uh, of the uh, 16010. We already have that. We also have that product with a built-in SWR meter, a dummy load, and a watt meter all built together hmm. in a box uh, not much bigger than that. Okay. Uh, um, and we're expanding the QRP line. So, so you know, we would that be battery powered, uh -huh. or does that need a separate power? It does. That doesn't need any power. Okay. Uh, but uh, there, there's so much. Uh, 
QRP and portable operation that we're, we're going to expand that line. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's becoming more and more popular. Another thing that people ask for, it, it seems is a, a lot of the radios now, like the, which started really with the K, um, the KX three was the very low output portable radio. And then people want amplifiers to go on top of them, uh, whether it's a, a small amplifier or, or something. Um, another one here from UA nine LIF. So shifting across now to, uh, to, uh, the other side of the world uh, are planned antennas for phased vertical systems and a K9AY receive loop. Um, so I guess basically are you planning any um, phased arrays? I know that's something that on the low bands is very uh, popular and whether that was um, with MFJ using uh, the MFJ 43 foot vertical or whether the customers build their own. Uh, one I guess what he's saying, one of the, the, the more difficult things to acquire these days are the phase boxes. So you can switch either four squares or nine square arrays to have directivity in, in various different directions. Um, so is that something well, that's a consideration? Need, uh, well, we don't have anything now, but we can sure take a look at it, especially something like the phase box. Uh, uh, those, those phase antennas are fairly difficult to first put up because of the space yeah. and the expense but to actually get them working everything has got to be done exactly right and i'm not sure how big a market is and for that reason we really hadn't looked at it but something like a phase box would be uh, would be an ideal product for us to make. Yeah. Um, now, as far as receiving, what we really have is re uh, receive loops, active receive loop that will um, do some of what the K9AY kind of receive loop yeah. does. But we don't have anything for transmitting that phase. Yeah, I, I. But like you said. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. No, but like you were saying, you, you know, you could buy multiple uh, of the antennas that we have and make your own phasing lines and, and you know, go through that whole process. Yeah. It's a pretty pretty complex precision process to go through to make the thing work. Yeah. Well, there was, there was one, actually, which is an interesting one. Um, it's a friend of mine in Spain, Echo Alpha 5, Italy Sierra Zulu, uh, Trevor. He and, and one of the other guys down there have two verticals on 40 meters and, and two on 20 meters. And they made the phase boxes to give east west um, options, or with the other um, way that they can be phased, whereas it gives south and north at the same time. Now, where they are, uh, having south and north at the same time isn't a problem to go straight down to Africa or straight. Uh, up towards uh, Norway, etc., or they can switch and have gain in either the easterly direction or westerly direction. And I think that was all all um, coax, but it had to be measured coax and that sort of thing. And a lot of people, if they haven't got the analyzers, to have that kind of you know a turnkey solution where they can build their antennas themselves or buy a pair of antennas with all the phasing arrangement, that might be something that works works well. Yeah. Well, I, I've looked into that, and that's something we probably should re-look at again. Now, we do have something that could be used. You know, when you're cutting those coax and phasing them, you have to be really precise. Yeah. Um, we have a box that will measure the phase difference. Right. It's got a meter on it. It's a digital phase meter. And that's the kind of thing in, for that, that people would be buying, yeah, to have that kind of level of, of accuracy in there, I guess. Mm -hmm. So that might be something to look yeah. at. Um, yeah. Okay, I've got a, uh, another one here from K5MGK. Uh, like some of the other uh, comments, um, I would like more uh, kits to be offered. Uh, and also he said he's just ordered a um, 
Vertronics Super SSB audio filter, which is another one of the, the lines that you have, of course. Um, uh, and um, we'd like to see some projects or, or kit projects in that. So is it uh, Vectronics? Is that, um, that's another one of the, uh, the, the product lines. Now, I know that the audio filtering um, side is becoming more and more prominent and people are getting more um, aware of the, the audio transmit audio. Is that something that you're finding is becoming more popular? Um, well, you know, that's what we started off with, the CWFTs, and, but we have had a number of products uh, for transmit audio. Uh, most of that is built into the newer radios now. They're basically equalizers. Now, we have some products that enhances transmit audio. I mean, for example... Most of the intelligibility is around 2 kilohertz. So we've got some products that will emphasize that part of it and then uh, remove the low-frequency content, which has got a lot of audio power, but it doesn't carry very much intelligibility. So the idea would be to remove low frequencies below 500 hertz or so and then peak up to 2 kilohertz for maximum intelligibility. Right. And we've got a box that allows you to do that. The big problem here is that uh, to be able to plug in different microphones and then to be able to plug it into the different radios. Right, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that I guess there would be different leads for different radios that would have to be separate model numbers, separate part numbers maybe. Yeah. yeah, the way that we solve that is we have a common connector, like um, um, one of those internet connectors for the microphone, Ethernet, yeah. and then we make cables. Yeah. Okay, adapters uh, to plug into the radio. Vectronics is where we have lots of kits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there was some, some of the the, would I be right in assuming that there were some. Um, amplifiers under that name as well, some small solid state amplifiers or not? Um, no, that was under Mirage. Okay. Yeah, those were the VHF amplifiers. Is that something that's still done? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, that was, that it, its heyday was earlier. Uh, when most VHF, UHF radio were low power. Right. Now most radios can put plenty of power in. So the higher power amplifiers from there is what sells now. Yeah, sure. Yeah, because uh, I guess things like the ICOM IC9700 has 100 watts out and 75 on 70 SEM. So you've got a pretty good uh, level of yeah. output on uh, those frequencies as well. Um, let me just see what else we've got here. ti 2 LX, uh, Francesco, can you add the RF current meter capability to the antenna tuners? Interesting question. Uh, um, <clears throat> you can, and that's a pretty easy thing to do. In fact, we used to have antenna tuners that had a built-in RF current meter. Right. <clears throat> and we build. Uh, RF current meter boxes that you can just screw in, just like a uh, a watt meter. Right. Okay. So is that uh, that something that could be a retrofit on current versions, or is it not not possible? Um, <coughs> no, <coughs> Excuse me. These were long time ago, but. Uh, it, it didn't make it I mean, nobody really cared right, okay <clears throat> yeah but now uh, you can just buy a box from us and just screw it in I see between yeah the antenna and the tuner I mean we have uh, we have uh, SWR watt meters with built in current meters we also have them for balanced lines so oh, yeah. you can see how balanced or unbalanced your uh, ladder line or open wire line is. That'd be an interesting one, especially mm -hmm. if there's a lot of people that are, are using 
the doublet type arrangements uh, these days so that might be a an interesting one to resurrect if it's not a current product so yeah talking of, of products and maybe futures uh, what's on the uh, the Martin Dew cooking pile at the moment? What's what futures do you have? <clears throat> well, um, we've got some new amplifiers coming out. Oh, okay, <clears throat> they're um, going through FCC now. Right. Uh, you were talking about a QRP amp. We're working <laughs> on one of those. Um, I mean, there's a lot of those coming from China, but none of those are FCC approved. Um, we're trying to come out with some um, more um, microprocessor type of products, things like uh, things that will help you learn Morse code. Okay, um, yeah. Uh, uh, there's one product... Um, that, you know, when you're using a telegraph key, um, a straight key, to form your own Morse code, uh, getting the, the time length of the dots and the dashes and the spaces and the word spaces. And, yeah. Uh, uh, this is a product that will allow, it will teach you and allow you to get it right. It, it measures that time for you and give you targets to check yourself on. Okay. Yeah. So we've got a uh, mobile antenna that's coming out, like a screwdriver, uh, but it's 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 more like an automatic antenna thing. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So I mean, what what it it's a binary sequence uh, uh, set of coils. It's just like an antenna tuner car, wow. auto tuner car, and um, you just dial it in, turn a knob and tune the frequency you want with memory. You can wow. uh, tune it up, push a button, you're tuned up. So is that something that needs to, to plug into a radio uh, on a RS-232 or something like that? Or No, you don't need to do that. You just... Uh, Tune it up once and push a button and memorize where it was. And then if you need to fine-tune it, just turn the knob. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. So has... Um, I just noticed again today, I got a, a mail coming through saying that it, it looks like the Dayton isn't going to be on again this year. Uh, and oh, I, really? And I, I know that um, whether that is... Uh, will be the case or, or not it's not very far away <clears throat> remains to be seen but i know that you guys were uh, had a, a big presence at all the the ham fests around the in the u.s has that had a, an impact on the, the the business model do you think for you mm, i don't think so no you know if you go to a show <clears throat> one person how many Let's take an eight-hour period of time, or let's just take one-hour period of time. How many people can you talk to in one hour? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I guess it's it's perhaps even um, reduced some of the annual costs by not uh, having these. Tre on. Tremendous. Yeah. Tremendously. At one time, we went to forty-five shows a year, wow. almost one every week. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big investment. Yeah, uh, but of course it's a, it's a commitment to the hobby. A lot of companies do this, and a lot of the, um, you, you know it, it's not necessarily, I guess, uh, a, a profitable um, event or a, pro a profitable um, uh, pastime. It's it's something to do get out to the the, the user base and uh, communicate with them, see what they want, and ideas for future products as well. Yeah, yep. you're right. You have to look at it as uh, advertising not as a profit center yeah look we're coming up to the hour mark now martin so i guess we better um uh, wrap things up here but i really appreciate your time okay. and and coming out to answer these questions for us um and um hopefully at some stage in the future if there's more questions we can get you uh get you on again but um okay. really appreciate it and um have a, well, have a great weekend well, Okay, well, thank you for 
asking me to be on and I had fun visiting with you and your audience and uh, hope everybody have a good weekend. Thanks again, Martin.